focusing in a little on energy. So if you wanted to propel an energy quest, if you were perhaps not President Obama, but the person closest to his ear who can actually convince him to make something uh, a priority for the next few years, how would you, again, getting, if that's the issue, then how do you get at that yeah, so, as, a, so, as a leader? So, so what you need to, I mean, what I feel we need to do is increase the intellectual and social capital available to university researchers around commercializing their work. You know, and, and by commercializing, I don't mean necessarily simply startups, even developing the technology to a point that it's viable to be licensed to a large company and put into practice, you know, would be delightful. Mm -hmm. um, so that intellectual and social capital is not something you can simply dole out, you know, a portion by Congress. But at the same time, there are weak spots in this pipeline where you can, they're pliable enough that you can make a change. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, and those are the graduate students, the, the PhD students and postdocs. Um, they are to, to move from energy to healthcare for a moment or to, you know, they are the stem cells of the university system. They are smart enough to become anything. They've done the research, they're usually advanced in their research, particularly the postdocs, they've completed their dissertation, but they have not yet become locked into the system. The life cycle of getting grants and, and publishing, re writing research, or conducting research and publishing and then getting the next round mm -hmm. of grants. So those people tend to be, the postdocs and PhDs tend to be the ones most able to change the way they do things. And they've been the ones that we work with who are most receptive to exploring the development, the commercialization of their ideas or of their laboratory's ideas. So if you, um, would they, if you had a choice of giving them a six month uh, sort of AAAS fellowship style experience or six months working at a corporation, yeah. then which would you do? I, I think, uh, uh, I think, uh, well, throwing... Or is that, is that even, is that a non-starter? Is that just sort of a silly idea? No, I, that's exactly what I think is necessary. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, the intellectual capital we can give through education. Mm -hmm. uh, the education that most scientists and engineers in their PhD programs have received is, uh, is sort of telling. It's, there's a statistic that 85% of researchers, graduating uh, advanced degree researchers, go into industry. But they're taught by the 15% who remain. So there's a, there's a wealth of knowledge and experience. That's quite a statistic. Wait, I wanted, that should settle in. Say that again. <laughs> that 85% of the graduating research scientists uh, go into industry, and you know, they're taught by the 15% who remained. Yeah. Uh, that, that means, though, that there is a wealth of experience out in industry that these people can tap into. Yeah. Uh, and, and so one of the things that I think is critical is that we do, in fact, you know, not displace the graduate research education. I think that's one of the things that makes the American science so, so strong, but that we add to it an element of understanding and experience around the commercialization. Uh, that's, uh, then, you know, and, then, and then the social capital that these people get through that educational process mm -hmm. can, be, can be enormously valuable. You know, one thing, uh, stepping back from the education arena specifically, I've written a lot on the blog about whether or not direct federal investment in basic research and development matter. Showing this curve over and over again, it's kind of like in, uh, a mantra, a visual mantra of our disinterest in energy compared to the other things we've sure. poured money into over the decades. And um, at that scale, does, is, that, is direct investment in basic R&D a, a, a gap or, or is it sort of a waste in the end? Well, you know, you will never hear me say that, that you know, we shouldn't have more investment in R&D. I think that's, you know, I, I, I'm always a big fan, um, and it's certainly it's the hand that feeds me. But I would say that uh, without increasing a complementary investment in, in technology transfer and development, we're, we're simply losing a lot of that money to, to fund uh, a, an academic research cycle that, that's not focused on, and not accountable to, to actually solving society's problems. And what about the sort? <clears throat> sorry, what about sort of the DARPA model and where, where it's um, where they're? Where I keep hearing from people. Well, look at the things that emerged from <laughs> money that yeah. we never anticipated would come from these That's areas. That's the key. The, the never anticipated part. Uh huh. You know, DARPA is a wonderful example of of funding something and getting something completely different. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't. I mean, obviously, the internet has helped our national security. But it wasn't, uh, you know, we don't look back and think, boy, we're a lot safer now that DARPA is, or, you know, that the Internet is around. Mm -hmm. What we do marvel at is how much our, our uh, you know, our online retail and, and online surfing and everything has changed the way we live. Mm -hmm. But none of that was envisioned when it was DARPA funded. Yeah. 
And I think you know, and, and you can go time after time and find that, that there are wonderful examples where great science, in fact, had a greater impact in another field. And now on the other end of the spectrum of argument, there's a persistent, strong argument that all we need is a cap on carbon, sort of a rising price on <laughs> pollution, and that will do it all, that the technology will just flow. Is that flawed? Right. Yeah. <laughs> or, well, or I, right. I've never been a fan of either the technology push or the, techno or the market pull arguments, and I think you, what you've just captured are both ends of that in, mm -hmm. the, in the energy debate. Uh, you know, if we, if we fund enough money, the technology will push its way to the market, and it, or if we... If we impose some carbon taxes, then, then the market will pull. I, I think having worked in, in industry for a while, I mean, the industry folks, are, like the academics, are pretty smart at figuring out how the game is played. And a carbon tax, in, in investing in, in, in breakthrough technologies in carbon, is probably number four or five on the list of strategies that, that companies will employ to bring a return based on this new environmental condition we're imposing, yeah. new market. And I think the, you know, the first will be obviously you know, denial <laughs> through lawyers and, and lawsuits. And, yeah. and then the second, you know, anger and, and, and reapportionment or reallocation of, of allowances and then a, a, a certain period of waiting. But I think most of it will be done in lobbying and, and strategic mm -hmm. shifts rather than in the actual uh, uh, you know, ways intended, which would be investments in, yeah. in new technological platforms. So it would take time for the, the atmosphere to actually notice. Right. And I think, you know, and most people will look at Europe and realize that the first two or three years, it's not worth doing much other than waiting and seeing because yeah. of the, the, the gyrations in that market. Right. So uh, looking at all of these things and looking at the reality that it's fairly complicated social um, issues that stand, in, in your view, at the heart of either impeding or facilitating change, are you optimistic, pessimistic, given where we're at right now? Uh, for uh, with something like uh, climate that, that will uh, will start to modulate our impacts. Well, certainly, in the in the long run, we'll adjust. So you know, between you know, mitigation, adaptation, and suffering, I, th I think I think we will manage to adapt. But I I I, I am s I would be more optimistic were I not uh, afraid that the debate is being prolonged by sort of economists and engineers. <laughs> who both see the world as a very rational place and can't understand why people don't behave accordingly. And these advances are generally not rational or predictable or... Well, you know, in hindsight, they always tend to be rational, but mm -hmm. it was for reasons that we didn't capture in the model going forward. That's interesting. Now, people act relatively rationally, but always for reasons that aren't, aren't quite that obvious when we, when we get started. Um, one last thing. Uh, is there any merit to uh, social networks uh, among scientists and innovators? Like the, I wrote a year or so ago about the New York Academy of Sciences has started an online thing called Scientists Without Borders. It's focused on global problems. and So it's basically people like Craigslist. You put up yeah, a, pro yeah. you know, I have a problem with uh, salt accumulating in, in soils in, in India. <laughs> Who's out there? <laughs> It, it, does any of that, is networking of that sort part of this? Networking is, is, is going to, yeah, I mean, well, networking will save us. I think it's safe to say. How it will save us is still uh, something we're discovering. I, I am a big fan of, of, of more uh, direct social networks, less the anonymous social networks that, you know, where somebody will sell you an idea that they had because you need it. Uh, there's simply too much work associated with moving an idea forward that a lot of these sort of idea market networks uh, ignore the fact that an idea by itself really doesn't do anything. And there's, yeah. an, you know, there's the 99% perspiration left after that uh, to make it work. So you might be able to call out to an anonymous crowd and get an answer, but that's the start of your project, not the end. Uh, yeah. and, and, and the rest of the project will be trying to build a, a, another network that actually helps you execute, get things done.